A good Sunday morning, uh, GCF East. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for worship here. A good Sunday morning also to, to all of you who are joining us online. Let us all rise and join me as I read uh, Psalm 111 verses 1 to 10. Let us read. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Let us pray. Father, we worship you today for you are holy, you are righteous, and you are just. You are merciful, you are loving, you are kind. And Lord, we gather here today to be in awe of your wisdom, of your glory, of your majesty. We pray that you prepare our hearts, our minds as we worship you today. And Lord, uh, for those who are yet to join us, Father, uh, may you just guide and protect uh, these people. And Lord, we just lift up your name and may you be honored in our midst. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let us join our hearts and voices in singing praises to our omnipotent and ever faithful God. Good morning, everyone. Um, please join us in singing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Yeah. 
Our God is amazing in all His works and ways. Please join us once more in singing. A couple of reminders on health safety uh, protocols during worship services. Let us always remember the following safety protocols as we continue to gather in person here in our church. Number one, we, our, we wear our face mask and face shield on always. And let us be mindful of physical distancing. If you had, have not done so, make sure uh, to drop your contact tracing form after writing down your temperature on it in the designated drop box before leaving the premises. 
kindly exit the sanctuary right after the service. If you must socialize, pick an area that is not congested and has free airflow. For your own safety, we encourage you to bring your own filled water bottles to church. Please make sure that the covers are secure so as to avoid cross-contamination. Water dispensers will not be available, and we thank you for understanding. For in-person church services, remember to always uh, reserve a seat for in-person services each week. Only 100 seats are available on a first text, first served basis. Once the 100 seats are filled up, you will be given priority for the following week. Only those ages 15 to 65 will be allowed. Text your name to the following cell phone numbers, 0922-246-1282 and 0915-703-3042. Please reserve early, preferably before Saturday, so we can prepare the contact tracing form early on. Cancel your slot as soon as you know you are unable to make it so others can take your place. We would like to remind everyone that we have an online children's worship every Sunday. Videos are posted at 7 a.m. on the GCFE's Sunday School Facebook page. We encourage your children ages 15 and below, to be part of this special time of worshiping the Lord. We will be having a membership class this, this month. There are already seven brothers and sisters who have signified their intention to join and be members of our church. If you have been attending this church and the Lord has been working in your heart to be part of the body of Christ here in GCF East, Please see Pastor John so that he can include you in the class. The date for the start of the membership will be announced later. Thank you. Our hearts are joyful whenever a fellow brother or a sister or a friend visit us for the first time here in GCF East. And join us for worship, of course. If this is your first time here in our church, kindly stand from where you are seated so we can recognize you and greet you and sing you and sing our welcome song for you. Any first-time guests in our meets? On the right side of the... Yes, we have first-time guests here on our left. Praise the Lord. So let us all stand, please, and let us greet one another with a smile, with a wave, or even a bow as we sing our welcome song. Thank you. You may all please be seated. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21, we read, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Church, let us be reminded that when we give faithfully to the Lord out of a cheerful and a willing heart, we store treasures in heaven that can never be taken away from us. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, the gifts that we receive each day. May it be uh, in the food that we eat or in the work that we have. May it be in the time that we spend with our family, with our loved ones, with our friends. We praise you for all these things. Lord, right now as we give, may you just um, remind us, O oh God, that you alone are the giver. And um, we pray that we always be faithful stewards of the blessings that we receive each day. 
And Lord, we praise you in all these things. In all these things we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. So as we have been doing since we started meeting face-to-face, -face, we request that you drop your offering to the offering box located near the entrance of the sanctuary. For those of you watching the live streaming of this service, you can still give your offering through online bank transfer to Green Hills Christian Fellowship East Inc. BPI Peso current account number 4091-004203. Or online bank transfer to Green Hills Christian Fellowship East Inc. UCPB dollar savings account number 1115-2000-06336. Or GCF East PayPal account, you can access at gcf-east.org slash give slash in our church website. Thank you and God bless. May I invite everyone to stand up again so we can sing another joy song for the Lord?
You may now all be seated. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, it's an encouragement for me to be seeing all of you here today. And to those who are visiting, welcome. Welcome to GCFE. So those who are watching us um, online, we thank you that you could join us as well in our uh, worship celebration. We will be having a break uh, from our series on the book of Psalms. To those who are joining us for the first time, we have been looking at the book of Psalms since March. And for the last 10 weeks, we were looking at, we were uh, focusing on the songs of Ascents, Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. And it's a joy for me for us to be gathered to- today since we are doing our communion after almost a year. We, yes, we have been uh, uh, meeting in person for the last two months. Two months now, right? And it's just a blessing for me. Because in as much as we can take advantage of the technology that we have today, as we have done so from March until December or November, because of the restrictions that the government has uh, placed on everyone, it's such an encouragement to be seeing all of you, even though you, I can just see your eyes. In fact, to be honest with you, I can't see you at all because of this glass. I can see myself. But, but it's a blessing for me to to. to see all of you, and again, nothing beats being around fellow believers in Christ. And so as we are about to do communion today, I I think it's just fitting for us to review, to go back, to have a break on Psalms and just go back to Scripture and and discuss and, and remember what this celebration stands for. And so, if you have your Bibles with you, kindly turn your Bibles not to the book of Psalms, but to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 17 to 34. And in reverence for God's word, may I ask everyone to please stand as we worship God through the reading of his word. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give direction when I 
come. May God bless the reading of His Word. You may now take your seats. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that we have Your Word, and we thank You for the privilege of being immersed and being under the ministry of Your Word. We pray nothing less, Lord, but Your truth preached, Your truth lived out, and we pray that you would search all our hearts, O oh God. Loving God, we ask you, beseech you, preach to our hearts, O oh God. Comfort us, convict us, encourage us, so that every heart here in this congregation, every heart, even watching this celebration, would be pleasing to you in your sight. This is our prayer with much thanksgiving. In Christ's most precious name, amen and amen. Again, good morning, everyone. One of my heroes, one of my heroes is Jonathan Edwards. Uh, uh, to those of you who loves reading, uh, some say he is the greatest preacher, greatest thinker, in fact, some say, that America has produced. But the British are claiming that they, they, he is theirs. But we know that Jonathan Edwards was born in the U.S., Jonathan Edwards is a faithful preacher of the Word, a good expositor, a good writer, a very good thinker, a, a, a profound theologian. He was a blessing uh, to his church in Northampton, Massachusetts. But did you know what? That this great pastor, this faithful preacher, was voted out of his church. And when the decision was turned in, 90% voted for him to be kicked out. 10% voted for him to stay. He was voted out because of his conviction about communion. With regards to communion, he was standing up with firm conviction that the Lord's Supper is an ordinance by God only for believers. He said two of the most important ordinances that was given that were given to us is baptism and the Lord's Supper, and both should be done by believers. My friends, in, in their church, prominent and majority of the church thought otherwise. They were saying, no, communion should be open to everyone, even unbelievers. It could be very well uh, be a means of grace by, by, by God that, that, that as they observe communion, even though they are not believers of God, that they would be saved. But Jonathan Edwards says no. And so he was voted out of that church. You see, friends, one of the most important things, one of the most important privileges one of the most important ordinances given to the church, the called out ones, those who believe in Christ Jesus, along with baptism is communion. Remember, if you would go at the back, that's what we see there in that big um, sign there. In Acts 2.42, we read, one of the essentials of the church is that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers, God's word, fellowship, koinonia, breaking of bread, and prayers. Today we would be revisiting the letter of Paul to the Corinthians to be reminded about the Lord's table. Now you see, friends, we all know that this letter is a corrective letter. Paul was writing to the church in Corinth to set things right about two things, about gifts about communion. Having said that, let me just ask you, did you notice that even recently, misunderstandings, disagreements, controversies are more on gifts, right? Discussions, disagreements, arguments, uh, focus more on gifts. None or at least a few controversies or arguments revolve around communion. And I think that is because we either think and assume that everybody gets it or find it not that important. So let me ask you, 
I mean, were you excited when we announced that we would be having communion the following Sunday, this Sunday? Well, why were you excited? Was it because you just wanted to do it? Because it was a routine for us. It was taken away from us for almost a year. And then we wanted to, for us to, to do it again. Friends, may I suggest that having a biblical, clear understanding of communion would translate into a mature Christian walk. Really, I believe that. I think getting communion, communion right would lead us to get most, if not all, about how we ought to be living as believers. Dear ones, if we understand the Lord's table correctly, I strongly believe it would lead to a conviction to live lives that is in accordance to what communion stands for. Have you ever wondered why? In the institution of the Lord's Supper, Jesus said, to do this in what? Remembrance of me. Why is that? Why? Why is there a call to remember? Because we are forgetful people. Because we have the tendency to not remember or to get it wrong. I know we went through 1 Corinthians already, but let's all together look at this beautiful section once again. Today's passage talks about the Lord's Supper, yet the problem is deeper than that in the church in Corinth. The problem is not just with their Lord's Supper. I think the problem is how they were walking their Christian life, how they were living their Christian life, and the Lord's Supper is just an expression of a deeper problem in the church in Corinth. Their problem was so deeply rooted that it began to become very obvious and evident in how they celebrate communion. The problem is that they have missed it. They failed to indeed remember what communion was all about. And I pray deep in my heart that we would be reminded once again to truly remember what this ordinance is all about. Before we begin, let's review. Let's, let's look at the background. So, we have been seeing, if you know the book of Corinthians, a lot of abuses in this church. And one of the abuses, one that they had grossly neglected, was the Lord's table or communion. That is the issue that we would see in this section. And, and you would see Paul is very upset. In fact, he has strong words in, in correcting what they were doing. Again, the context, points, the context points to the Lord's Supper. Remember, on that night when Jesus was, was to be betrayed, he was with his disciples, his friends, celebrating the Passover meal. Remember? And, and he was leading the Passover meal. And what is the Passover about? We, we've been studying about that, right? In, in the book of Exodus. It's when God rescued the Israelites from, from more than 400 years of bondage. To Egypt. It was then he sent many plagues, plague after plague after plague. Remember, each one was attacking an Egyptian false god. God was making a statement, I am the only true God. Remember the last plague? The angel of death. God has ordered the Israelites to slay a little ewe lamb and mark their doorpost with its blood so that the angel of death would pass over their household, sparing every firstborn from death. The next morning, remember, they were, they were wailing and weeping all over Egypt. All of the firstborn of the land died, including the Pharaoh's son, except those who were inside the house with blood all over their door and doorpost and lintel. That led the Pharaoh to let them go. And God has instructed His people to observe this, remember this, as a memorial of Him rescuing them. So let's go back to Jesus with His disciples. That night, 
Jesus was doing something beautiful. He was eating the Passover meal with his disciples in remembrance of God's rescue of Israel from slavery from Egypt. But Jesus took that meal and transformed it into something more glorious. He took a cup on the Passover meal. He took bread on the Passover meal and made a magnificent glorious transition. He said, this cup is my blood. This bread is my body. And as you partake this, you do this in remembrance of me. And so now as we look at the great redemptive plan of God, we don't go to Egypt anymore. We go to Calvary. When we, when we look back, back to the blood we're not talking about the blood of the little ewe lamb. We're talking about the blood of the spotless lamb. The lamb of God who would take away the sins of those who would believe in him. That night, Jesus was transforming, transitioning from the Passover meal to communion. This became very normal for the early church. They saw that Jesus desired for, for them to to have the central point of their gathering to be what he did. So the early church did that. Historians and theologians would agree that before they do communion, they have a potluck. They, they gather together, bring, they bring food, and together eat before they do communion. It's called a love feast, an agape feast. So when they gather, they have this Potluck first, diba? that's what we're known for, diba? GCF eats, uh, East. Well, GCF feast now, GCF feast. Right? That's what they, what they did. Then they transitioned to communion, remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. And someone would preach the word. But the Corinthian church, friends, they have blemished this beautiful image of unity and commonality in the life of the church. And this is what Paul is going to address. And so, friends, as we approach the Lord's table, the Lord's table of grace, as we remember Jesus, let us indeed remember Him as we discuss three recollections in communion that I believe would change and impact our Christian walk. Three recollections in communion for the worthy Christian walk. We have three headings. In verse 17 to 22, we see that we avoid being selfish. We avoid being selfish and start being considerate with one another. This is found in 17 to 22. In 23 to 26, we, we remember the selfless, amazing, glorious sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. We remember the selfless sacrifice of Jesus. 27 to 34, the last heading, we then should examine ourselves. We examine ourselves. Three recollections. Let's now go to the first one. Look at verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worst. Verse 17 reads, I do not praise you. I do not commend you. And, and Paul was saying, uh, these instructions, as I give you these instructions, what instructions is Paul referring to? I hope you have your Bibles open to, 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 to 1 Corinthians. If you go to verse 2, we would read, Paul commends them and praises them. Verse 17, he says, I do not praise you. So there's a clear transition then. He is not referring to the previous instructions. He is referring to what he is about to give them. In giving these instructions, listen, Corinthians, I do not commend you. He's not happy at all. We're the church in Corinth. Why? Because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. What a painful, painful thought coming from their founding pastor. Barely 20 years after the ascension of Jesus, 
with most of the eyewitnesses still alive. Along with their testimonies, we saw Jesus. Not to mention Paul's powerful conversion on the road to Damascus. I'm pretty sure he shared that with them. Not to mention his teachings. Instead of growing deeper, listen, instead of getting more mature, they actually became worse. Paul continues in verse 18. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part. He said, I've been hearing divisions among you. And I believe it in part. What does he mean by that? I believe it in part. I believe that he means that there is, that that, that is what he's been hearing. He's giving them the benefit of the doubt. But since he is their founding pastor, he has a good idea of their tendencies. There are divisions, yes. In fact, what has been reported to me may be even worse. That's why we read, I believe it in part. So what we see here, friends, is, is Paul sharing with us that there are problems in the church of Corinth. They are torn with divisions, dissensions. He then goes on in verse 19, For there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Huh? Well, what does that mean, Paul? I, I can't understand you. A while ago you were saying, there are divisions among you, and you seem to be upset by that. But now you, we, we read, he's saying, but well, there must be factions among you. Listen, Paul is saying that these divisions, these problems, these struggles in the church would actually be means of grace by God for the church. Why? Because these struggles would reveal who the genuine believers are. Who the spiritually mature are. Such ugly divisions is not, not good. We, we, it's painful. But here we see it would actually act like a filter to show who the true regenerate are. And who are the reprobates? Factions, struggles, problems are ugly. They can be painful and should be dealt with by the church. But such, at times, can be used by God to reveal the redeemed from the reprobate, the saved from the saved, so they claim. This is glorious, friends. This is where we see Paul embracing, listen, the sovereignty of God. There are problems in our midst, yet God is in control. There are problems in the church, divisions in the church, but God is in control. Can you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 as we see these divisions? We need to find out these problems that Paul was mentioning here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10, we read, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of the, our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Cleo's people that there is quarreling among you. My brothers, what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or Peter, or, or I follow Christ. Paul was urging them, pleading with them in the name of the Lord, that they agree in the Lord, and let no divisions cause any problems, and that they would be mature by being like-minded, having the same convictions. Dear ones, instead of being a testimony of being united in Christ, in the gathering together of believers, where we are all equal, they have drifted away from the real essence. They have forgotten to remember what communion stand, stood for, with being one in Christ. That's why we see Paul passionately asking them to be united. If you observe carefully, dear ones, what caused the division? What caused the problem? 
There were those who probably were there longer. They said, we follow Paul. There were those who loved Apollos because Apollos is a good speaker. And they say, we follow Apollos. There are those who admired Peter's itinerant ministry and being uh, uh, one in the inner circle of Jesus Christ. They say, I fo follow Cephas. And there are those who would like to project a facade. We are spirituals. We only follow Christ. Well, was there a need for a division? The tension was not caused by any doctrinal issue. Because Paul, Apollos, Cephas, especially, of course, Christ, all affirmed, all agreed in doctrine. It was caused by petty preferences, issues, personalities, favorites. The division was caused by trivial things, not by heretical threats. So those divisions are actually nonsense. Later on, he, Paul would ask, in fact, is Christ divided? Is Paul crucified? Was Paul crucified for you? He would later on say, he planted, Apollos watered, but God was the one who gave the growth. Why are we discussing even this? From the outside looking in, it seems like the Corinthians' problem is so easy to point out. Yun lang man pala we, we could address that. No, friends. If we would not be careful, these disagreements, these divisions can slowly creep in and disrupt this church. What, what is the safeguard then? What, what is the safeguard to not fall into that snare? God's word faithfully preached and humbly lived out. Remembering what Communion stands for. With my whole heart, dear ones, I pray that we are convinced that God's Word is enough. More than enough. Dear ones, I earnestly hope that we are all resolved to please God as a church by doing church His way. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 11. Look at verse 20. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. You see how deeply rooted this is? There are problems in their midst. So therefore, when they gather together, Paul was saying, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another one is drunk. Dear ones, at the birth of the church, Slaves and poor people got saved too. And, and there became a common brotherhood between a master and his slave, the rich and the poor. Such beautiful picture of everyone's neediness for the gospel and the uniting message of the gospel. There were needs. But they are being met. We have poor people who would actually look forward to the love feast because they know they would, they would have a meal shared with the other brethren and probably that would be their, the best meal of the week. The master who has lots would share what, what he has. They be, began to be equals. And being equals was more evident in the celebration of the breaking of bread. Now in Corinth, they had absolutely messed this up. They had corrupted any meaning out of it. In fact, they had turned it into what they were used to be in their paganism. Every man for himself. So when they followed it up with the Lord's, Supper, remember? Love feast muna before they do communion. But so when they followed it up with the Lord's Supper, it dishonored God. It made him detest what they were doing. That he decided, God decided to make some of them 
sick. In fact, some of them were so sick, some died. Listen, dear ones, hindi ko inimbente yan. I did not make that up. It's in Scripture. God was dismayed. The Lord's table became such an abomination in the platform for selfishness. It was a mockery and blasphemy against the cross. And God would not tolerate that. So we, let, let's picture that. The rich people would bring their food. It was supposed to be shared. It was supposed to be a common meal. Christianity broke down barriers. Now they're putting up new ones. They would come together and the rich people would go there early and eat their own food. So when the poorer gets there, no more food left for them. Some were becoming gluttons. Some are drunkards. Some are now hungry. So, it was a mockery. A picture of self-love. A picture of selfishness. Now, Paul says your actions have so corrupted everything that he says in verse 20, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Did you hear that? Paul was saying, you might be thinking that you are honoring God. You might be thinking that you're remembering Christ. It's not the Lord's Supper you're eating. I wonder if we can say the same in this congregation. In fact, if you would look at the original language, Paul is actually saying it is impossible that you are indeed glorifying God. Verse 31, in eating, everyone takes before the, the other his own supper. Anong klaseng patlak yan? Di ba? You go there with your food and sit in the corner and eat it fast so that the others won't see, oh, kare-kare, paborito para man pastor to. Selfishness. We have both extremes here. Hungry people, drunk. You call this church? You call this Lord's Supper? You call this fellowship? You call this gathering together of believers? You call this glorifying to God? How can this be glorifying to God when you keep on hating each other? How can this be a common, a common unity of the saints? You've missed the point, Paul was saying. Dear ones, you see, if we understand that during communion, it's not just because of the ritual, it's remembering that we should no longer be living for ourselves. To stop being selfish and be considerate of others for God's glory and the edification of the church. If only we are serious about this ordinance. Sana talaga seryoso tayo. Now Paul would go on and ask a series of rhetorical questions. They're actually statements made by Paul. Verse 22, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Friends, listen. Try to figure out what Paul is feeling here. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Is it because you don't have houses? That's why you eat it here ahead of the others? Are you homeless? And go to church and eat your supposedly shared meal. Is that it? Or maybe it isn't that you don't have a house. Paul would go directly to the heart. Maybe it's because you despise the church. 
Maybe, maybe you don't really love Christ. You don't really love the church. Why are you hurting the church? Maybe your problem is that you hate the church. You, you claim to love the church. You hate your brother. You just want to destroy the commonality that this ordinance stands for. Maybe your desire is to take the thing which Jesus had brought with his precious blood and wreck it. Is that it? I'm reminded of Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. In the gathering together, we are supposed to consider how to edify others. We don't go to church and think, what can I get from this church? We ought to be coming to church and be considering how can I help this church? How can I build up this church? Our focus should not be on self, but on the greater good of the body and the glory of God. Here in the Corinthian church, we see otherwise, and we can see that with how they perceive and celebrate communion. What we see here is selfishness, inconsiderate people, destroying genuine fellowship. Again, I pray, dear ones, that we can say the same for this church. And if there are any divisive thoughts lingering in your hearts and minds, let me just warn you. This is God's church. I pray that every thought be captive to the obedience of Christ and yield to His command that we ought to be one. Beloved, a church who is one in the Word proclaims Jesus loudly to the world compared to a church filled with selfishness and inconsideration. God desires for us to be one. God desires for us to understand, to indeed remember what this is for. Let me say from the heart, I'm really blessed with how God is building His church in this side of His vineyard. How God has been bringing people to this church who desire to be in the Word and live for the Lord. But I would still like to urge this church to be deliberate in our pursuit of having a high regard for God's Word, loving others, and being considerate, submitting to the great design what, which we see in the ordinance of communion, our being one with the Lord. The Lord's Supper reminds us and ought to remind us to be selfless and to be considerate of others. Why would we? Why? Because that is what the church is about. And that is what the Lord's Supper reminds all of us, of the selfless love and sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is our next heading. Look at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I love this. This is very typical of Paul. He gave them the beautiful account of Jesus' last shared meal with his disciples before his crucifixion. 
the night when he transitioned from the Passover meal to the Lord's Supper, a meal that he is commanding or, or he has commanded for us to remember. And this is the lifeline of the church, to look at the selfless, amazing, glorious love of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of our Passover lamb. To those of you who are studying Exodus with me, remember Exodus 12? As God was instituting the, the Passover, God commanded Moses on the first day, or on the 10th day of this month, gather for yourselves the, a, a spotless, unblemished little ewe lamb. When will they slaughter that lamb? On the 14th day. Why is that? Did you even think, why do we need to have this, this lamb for five days? So that when they slaughter this little cute lamb, the kids would ask, why? D Dad, why? Because this lamb has no blemish. That's why. Why? Remembering Christ entails more than, I remember 2,000 years ago, he died on the cross. And this is so typical of Paul. It's like him laying down a black velvet uh, um, material and then put a diamond in the middle. What would happen? You would see the diamond glowing. The previous section, we saw self selfishness, inconsideration. Now we see the selfless act of Christ. He is reminding them. He is highlighting the selfless act of Jesus, whom they claim to be celebrating when they gather together to show them how wicked they have become. Let me ask all of you. I pray that this is not true for this church. I pray that indeed we have love and consideration for each other because that is how we see that is what we see in Christ that is what we see in Christ Paul reminded the church he's reminding us right now of the great redemptive plan of God through this covenant sealed with the blood of Jesus I'm reminded again Ezekiel 36 remember the, the new covenant let me just read this to you. I will sprinkle water on you. I will remove your heart of stone and put a heart of flesh. Did you notice that no one is actively involved in this passage but, but God? Diba? This is a monergistic approach. It is all God's doing. So why would you look down on others? Why would you be selfish? Why would you be inconsiderate of others when Jesus, who is God, died for you. Can, can you look that, at this passage again? Verse 23-24. Do this in remembrance of me. It is a command. Are we commanded to just do the ritual? What are we commanded to do? Do this in remembrance. That is important. Go back to the cross. The, go back to the cross. And as we approach the Lord's table after almost one year, let us contemplate and meditate on that. The perfect atonement for sins of those who would believe in God I'm just still blown away with the five days that the little ewe lamb needed to stay with the family. What would happen? You would develop, the kids would probably uh, um, get attached to, to the little ewe lamb and then it would be slain. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper, 
I pray that indeed we are remembering what this stands for. It's not like, oh, I remember. It's not like, oh, I remember last Thursday I went to this place or that. No. Remember the sinless one. Remember the spotless lamb. Do you even, friends, the invitation is to have an emotional emotional uh, um, inventory. Do you even love Christ? As we remember the great imputation, the great substitution, we are commanded to do and observe communion and remember and contemplate what it stands for. Are you doing that? Are you doing that well? You see why I say getting communion right would lead us to have godly convictions. That it would not be just once a month then. If we understand what the gospel stands for, we should not be selfish. We should be loving. Why? Because God expressed the greatest love of all. Learning to love yourself is not the greatest love of all. The greatest love of all is when God became man and died while we were sinners. So that those who would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. We remember to not be selfish and be considerate. We remember the selfless act of Jesus. How do we do that? Let's lead us to the next heading by examining ourselves. Look at verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, we will be guilty concerning the blood, the body and blood of the Lord. What do you mean by an unworthy manner? Okay. How, how do we do that? How do we celebrate? How do we, 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 we gather together in the Lord's table in an unworthy manner? I like how J.C. Ryle puts it. J.C. Ryle says, bringing our unworthiness, remembering our unworthiness is the most worthy manner that we can observe communion. Did you hear that? understanding that we are all saved by grace we were depraved by default but God being rich in mercy made us alive in Christ and loved us with a beautiful glorious love that is the worthy manner flip side of that thinking trivially of the Lord's Supper or thinking oh I deserve to be saved in the Corinthian church, they were selfish. They, didn't, they did not follow the selfless example of Jesus. So they, as they partake of the Lord's Supper, they were doing it in, an, in a very unworthy manner. So Paul says they are guilty of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, dear ones. What do you mean by that? Paul says that if we take communion in a very unworthy manner, it would be we will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. What do you mean? In as much as burning the Philippine flag, just for kicks, ah, gusto ko lang, trip, trip lang. Or even because of some ideology, it would be offensive to the Philippines and her trail of rich history. Diba? So is treating the Lord's Supper with triviality and casually. It is detestable to God. To come to worship God, especially in the Lord's table, where we remember the great act of redemption while still clinging to our sins, our selfishness, dishonors God and belitt belittles and blasphemes the sacrifice of the Lord. Again, dear ones, I just say this very lovingly. I'm pouring out my heart to you because this is the most loving thing that I can do for all of you. 
I pray that in our gathering to get to today, our worship is indeed honoring. Our worship is indeed pleasing to the Lord. Sana yung mga kantahan natin kanina, I pray that the singing that we, we did a while ago, the prayers that we, we uttered, indeed gives praise to the Lord. Indeed gives gladness to His heart. If not, Paul says in the succeeding verses, let a person examine himself. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and many have died. But if you judge yourselves truly, we would, be, we would not be judged. When we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. We must what? Examine. Who? Ourselves, not others. We must examine ourselves. We must assess ourselves to see if we are fit, to see if our hearts are right. And if not, then we must ask God to help us, to cleanse us, to forgive us. We must ask God to search our hearts for us to be worthy. Otherwise, it would just be detestable to the Lord. And Paul said we must judge again ourselves not others. Stop pointing at other people's lives. Eh, pastor siya, oh, eh, ikaw. If you have a problem with a brother or a sister, approach that brother, approach a sister, as prescribed in Matthew 18. Before we rebuke people of their speck, let us make sure that there are no logs in our eyes. Look at verse 31, 32 again. But if we judged ourselves truly, faithfully, we would not be judged. Paul is saying if we are thorough, if we are honest in assessing ourselves, if we assess ourselves through the lens of Scripture, if we agree with God, with what we find in our hearts. Remember 1 John 1, 9? If we confess, if we agree If we agree with the Lord, with His Word, He's faithful and just to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Let us assess ourselves in the light of Scripture. Ano sabi dyan? But if we judge ourselves truly, we, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be judged, condemned along with the world. Does this text say we will be condemned with the world? That we would be, that we would be losing our salvation? That when, we, when we are not serious about our faith? Does this text say that you can lose your salvation? Definitely not. It would not be in harmony with the rest of the scripture that relays the assurance of salvation. Again, this is addressed to the church, di ba? Dissension, struggles can be a, a filter that would reveal who the true believers are, are and who the unbelievers are. With regards to the believers, Paul was saying, if we sincerely assess and test ourselves with regards to our remembrance of uh, communion, with regards to our uh, walk, then we will not be disciplined. But if we do otherwise, then we will be facing chastisement, even the, to the point of putting us to death. Huh? Listen to John MacArthur. I like how he puts it. He reads, it reads, Believers are kept from being consigned to hell because you are secured. Believers are kept from being consigned to hell, not only by divine decree, but by divine intervention. Diba? We are being kept. Diba? Now to Him who is able to uh, keep us from stumbling. The Lord chastens to drive His people back to righteous behavior and even sends death to some in the church to remove them before they could fall away. What is He saying? If you are a believer at antigas ng ulo mo, God can just kill you. I didn't say that. That's what the passage is saying. So what do we have here? 
besides being unified and having a genuine consideration towards others, avoiding selfishness, we need to be remembering the selfless act of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to examine ourselves as well. And I believe, and I strongly believe, that that would translate not just in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. I think it would translate into a wonderful walk worthy of our calling. Friends, getting rid of all sorts of selfishness and being considered with others, remembering and following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, who though was in every essence God, was humble, obedient, and selfless to the will of the Father to the point of dying on the cross. We examine ourselves through the lens of Scripture that I believe would go beyond communion. It would translate into a humble, worthy walk, pleasing to the Lord. Now we still have the final verses. Look at verse 33 to 34. I love this. I just love this. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. Patlak nga eh. Kumain ka sa bahay. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. Sabi ni Paul, in your observance of the Lord's Supper, you have to be waiting for one another. What was happening was people were going ahead of themselves, people were hungry, people were drunk, people be, uh, are becoming gluttons. Paul was saying, let's be waiting for one another. And Paul writes in the 13th chapter of this beautiful letter, love is patient. In a way, Paul was saying, be loving to each other. Love one another. The main thing here is that the Lord's Supper is an example of a bigger issue that Paul is trying to address. And how did Paul address that? Showed them, Paul just showed them that their selfish acts. Paul led them to look at the selfless act of Jesus. Then he commanded them to examine themselves. And just for kicker, the left hook, love one another. I pray that as we, the church here in this side of the Lord's vineyard, I pray that we are not selfish. I pray that we are considerate. I pray that we indeed are remembering, going back to how And can it be? Iba? Amazing love, how can it be? That you, my king, uh, I like it better, that you, my God, would die for me. God would die for you? Remember that, friends. And examine yourselves. And I strongly believe this would be helpful, this would be tremendous in our walk. If you're here today and have not totally surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, may I remind you that there is no other name under heaven or earth that you can be saved but by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. He died so that those who would believe in Him would have eternal life. You may enjoy the people here or enjoy how friendly we are. Yes, we love you being here. But friends, we don't want just to be friends. We want to be brothers and sisters with you. So I pray that God would give you faith. I pray that you would respond in repentant faith and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Those who have already surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ, I pray that we indeed were convicted. I pray that we indeed remembered what communion stands for. So the church as a whole, I pray that we would all be resolved to be 
last rather than first. To be an encouragement, not a cause for someone to stumble. To serve and not to be served. I pray that we would be conscious, deliberate, and intentional to be selfless like the Lord Jesus Christ and continually examine ourselves for the edification of the church and for the utmost glory of the head of the church. Pray with me. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us. Yes, Lord, we are forgetful people. Yes, Lord, we have missed what communion stands for. And so by your grace, we ask you to encourage all of us, Lord, to avoid being selfish. Follow your selfless, selfless act and continuously ima- examine ourselves in and through the lens of Scripture. We desire to honor you, Lord, as we approach your table of grace. We love you. Thank you for loving us in spite of us. In Christ most precious name we pray. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. There was you were given a pre uh, package. Um, elements. I encourage you to open them now as we remember the Lord. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples, ordinary men who would do extraordinary work. He broke bread, gave thanks to his Father and said, this is my body which will be given for you. The body that will be crushed for you to be whole. Do this in remembrance of me. Dear ones, the gift of God to the people of God, let us remember and worship Jesus Christ. When supper was ended, he took the cup, the cup of redemption. Again, he gave thanks to his father and said, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the, of the new and everlasting covenant, the blood that will be spilt for the forgiveness of sins and the cleansing of your guilt. Do this in memory of me. Dear ones, the gift of God to the people of God. Let us remember and love and worship Jesus Christ. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for that great act of love. Kami dapat ang parusaan, Panginoon Diyos. But you know our suffering would not be enough to save us. It would just be right for us to be punished. We thank you, Lord, for that great love by which, Lord, you gave up your life for for us. Lord, help us remember. We want to remember. Lord, help us, Lord, 
live this out. We thank you, Lord, for that sacrifice. We thank you for that great love. We love you, Lord, even though at times we don't show it. We, go, we identify, Lord, with what Peter said. You know everything, Lord. The only means by which we can love you is because you loved us first. And so accept our love, gratitude, and worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. May I ask everyone to please stand and let us thank the Lord for what He has done. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of what communion stands for. And we pray that by Your grace, we would indeed live this out, not just once a month, but every day of our lives until You come back for us. As we depart this place temporarily, we pray that You bestow upon us Your blessing. May God, who gave His Son to die for those who would believe in Him. Find each one of us loving each other, proclaiming that great love by which we were loved, by being one. And may we be the gospel that people see and read. May we proclaim His excellencies. May we point people to the one who is spotless, unblemished, the one who could truly save while we wait for His coming back. May we, the church, be indeed His ambassadors wherever we are, wherever we go, whatever we do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You're all dismissed. Thank you very much. Ingat po kayo.